I think that people are still uh, returning to the room. Uh, I've been told to, uh, to speak for about 20 minutes because you're running a little bit behind schedule. I've just, uh, just come from, from Bangkok and uh, I'll be going back uh, after this. Uh, look, I just want to say just a few, few key messages. The next session you have is about straight lines and curved lines. Um, so I will say that uh, there's, a, there's a third element in there. Uh, there's a circle. There's a circle. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, in a short, short space of time, uh, how the world is, is becoming. I think uh, the main message here is that the, the world is going to face a lot of headwinds. There will be a lot of headwinds. The, the international order, international system, as we know it, uh, is unraveling. It's coming loose and it has implications, consequences for all of us. Uh, the second message is that, you know, as we face more headwinds in the world, uh, we are uh, in the right place. We are the place that we want to be, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, the world is going to be really unpleasant, but uh, Southeast Asia is a good uh, refuge. Um, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about geopolitics, global power shifts, talk about ASEAN, Southeast Asia, and then maybe just a very quickly, a, a quick scan of the region, different countries, uh, democracy, de democratization, authoritarianism, how we have to navigate, uh, a little bit about economic development, uh, economic development uh, dynamics model that we're seeing emerging in the region, and some implications for, for the hospitality industry. Uh, we used to think that you know, the next session is about curved lines and straight lines. Uh, we used to think that the world was becoming a straight line, that we had found uh, a way to resolve conflict. Uh, if we came up with the right set of rules, institutions, uh, this would uh, eschew, avoid, prevent, mitigate uh, conflict. And this has been the case for the last uh, seven decades. If you look at the last seven decades, you know, since uh, World War II, we've had uh, an international system built on the, the Bretton Woods uh, uh, agreement, basically uh, international trade, international finance, the United Nations, international institutions as, as we know it. And the, the high point, the crowning achievement, I think, of the post-war order was the European project, the European integration. Uh, but in the last uh, decade or so, we're seeing some unraveling, a kind of a global unravel that may suggest to us that uh, uh, we're seeing the return of history that in fact maybe uh, is not linear. We haven't found uh, any absolute. So it's not curvy, it's not straight. Perhaps uh, history is kind of circular. And uh, it takes some years to unfold, but uh, it seems that the evidence is pointing in that direction. We can see this most clearly with the U.S.-China trade war, which I think is going to get worse. Uh, I spoke with a senior, senior White House official to, after the Trump and Kim summit, and it's interesting, you know, the conversation with, with this uh, NSC official uh, was like talking about the future. Everything that he said is happening. Uh, the U.S. will exact uh, costs uh, on China's uh, unwillingness to open its economy. China didn't play by the the rule didn't follow the bargain of joining WTO and opening up. Uh, so U.S.-China trade war uh, is likely to get worse. We're seeing uh, some retaliation, some tit for tat. But what is significant from this, this so-called trade war is the U.S. Uh, perception premise. You know, the U.S. constructed the post-war order. I mean, this is a, the, the country that uh, showed it uh, from the Marshall Plan. They reconstructed Europe. Japan. The international order as we know it uh, was largely instrumentally built, maintained by the U.S. But this trade war, uh, the U.S. now feels that under the Trump administration, it is, it is the victim. It, it no longer will shoulder uh, the burdens of the liberal international order. And uh, the U.S. feels that it is the aggrieved party. Uh, now this is something that we haven't seen before. It normally I think Trump is the first post-post-Cold War president. He is the first one to say 
uh, that no longer, it doesn't reject outright, but it does not accept the liberal international order as we know it. So he plays uh, transactional, bilateral, it goes uh, case by case, project by project. We will see the U.S. is no longer going to, to, to bear the burden of maintaining the liberal international order as we know it. And we will have a lot of consequences and implications from that. ASEAN, in the midst of this uh, global power ship, uh, you know, is in between, between China and the U.S., but also Japan, Australia, India. Uh, ASEAN and Southeast Asia are distinct. You have uh, a regional organization, ASEAN. Southeast Asia is a, is a region of, uh, of different countries, different regimes, different, uh, different religions, ethnicities, languages. The um, ASEAN is now based, uh, has uh, come up with its own uh, ASEAN charter, a kind of a legal entity, a legal uh, document. Uh, and it's trying to remain front and center of regionalism, of regional architecture building. So if you see the ASEAN charter is premised on this political security com community, APSC, AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, ASEC, ASEAN Social Cultural Community. If you look at the regionalism in, in, um, in Asia, ASEAN is, is the linchpin, right? So APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, the ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum, um, ADMM Plus, ASEAN Defense Ministers Meetings Plus, East Asia Summit, ASEAN Plus Three, and the acronyms that, uh, and alphabet soup that we have, ASEAN is the, uh, the central pillar uh, and now we're seeing some challenges. The U.S. is peddling the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is, uh, um, you know, in, in a short time, I have to be very concise. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is really a pushback against China's Belt and Road. The China's, the China's uh, Belt and Road is, is really a manifest destiny of the Chinese. And uh, the Indo-Pacific groups... Uh, U.S., Japan, Australia, and India, and they ring, and they form the perimeter vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So ASEAN now is beset, again, with major power rivalry, major power competition, uh, adversarial posture between the U.S. and China, just like the way that the Soviet Union used to be with the U.S. back in the 1950s, 60s, leading to the formation of ASEAN. So ASEAN is very much challenged now, um, the U.S. is trying to maintain its resilience um, through the Trump administration, especially in the maritime domain, in the South China Sea, especially pushing back against China. For, for China, uh, its manifest destiny is to regain an imperial glory that it lost over the last couple of centuries. The AIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, BRI, which used to be called OPOR, One Belt, One Road, now called Belt and Road Initiative. This is really a, a function of greatness. And it's supposed to be win-win. It's a way of releasing uh, excess capacity, uh, but also a way of uh, expanding influence, prestige, uh, and growth on the Eurasian landmass. If you look at the Belt and Road, you know, the Belt is on land. The, the Maritime Silk Road is in the sea from the South China Sea to East Africa. This, these were the old Silk Roads. These were the old trade routes. So China is merely regaining, trying to regain what it, what it's lost over the last couple of centuries. Um, it's being constrained. I think there's some, some mistrust of Chinese intentions. There's some pushback in Sri Lanka, I mean, Cambodia, in uh, Sihanoukville, for example. Australia is, uh, has come up with uh, a very uh, strict measures against uh, China's moves in Australia, New Zealand doesn't allow uh, Chinese to buy property anymore. I mean, you look around the region in Africa, there's some resentment against uh, Chinese investors, workers. So there's some, so some pushback. Uh, South China Sea, uh, the Chinese have built uh, artificial islands, weaponized them. And, you know, if you look at the, the map, basically, the South China Sea is now China's backyard. Lan Chang Mekong, the Mekong region now is also seen as uh, China's backyard. China has built uh, upstream dams to the detriment of downstream communities. So China is writ large. China is writ large. The renminbi, uh, China is trying to, to use the renminbi as a global reserve currency. Uh, so uh, the Belt and Road, I think, is partly designed to promote the renminbi. 
And uh, we're seeing some pushback, and the Chinese have some, some challenges, I think. Uh, they don't have the draw, the appeal. Uh, they don't have the structural power of the U.S. dollar. Whatever happens, the U.S. dollar has structural power. Same with, you might say, the English language. So, you know, um, to the extent that uh, China can expand through Belt and Road, through the, um, you know, the Silk Road Fund, the AIB, all these uh, funding mechanism and mechanisms and financing vehicles, uh, its reach is, is limited because of language, because of structural power behind the U.S. dollar. So we will see this, this kind of confrontation and rivalry and competition uh, panning out over the next decade. For ASEAN, being in the midst of major power rivalry and competition, ASEAN itself uh, also is facing some internal challenges. You know, its reason of being, it came into being, to maintain regional autonomy, to foster, cultivate national economic development, um, to keep the powers from interfering with the region. Right? It's post-colonial time in the 1960s. Um, but now, ASEAN is divided by China, over the South China Sea in particular. China can exercise veto over ASEAN through Cambodia at will. Um, in addition, the different regimes of ASEAN also coming under stress. Uh, we have uh, you know, just a very quick uh, survey. There's been a, a rising resurgent authoritarianism in Southeast Asia. You see one party, elected one party rule, dictatorship really in Cambodia. Uh, some, some authoritarian uh, upsurge in um, Myanmar through the army. Thailand has the military government. Uh, Indonesia is at the forefront of democratization in the region, but even Indonesia, um, the president has picked uh, a conservative uh, a cleric to, to run to, on the ticket uh, in the next election. So even Indonesia is seeing some erosion, some, some concerns about backtracking. Um, Malaysia, a bit of good news, Mahathir has uh, got re-elected, but uh, through PN, uh, uh, Pakatan Haripan, but uh, don't know how that will go. Uh, for now, Malaysia is an uh, exception to this rising authoritarianism, resurgent authoritarianism, but you know, Brunei, Laos, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Singapore, and Indonesia, I would say, uh, at the forefront of democratization in the region. I wouldn't say that about Singapore 20 years ago, but now uh, they have electoral rule, they have a responsive government, even, even though it's a one-party rule. The export-led model of Southeast Asia no longer uh, the mainstay in the region. Before you had, uh, you know, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, uh, ASEAN was successful, phenomenal, in uh, promoting export-led growth. Now it's more uh, regional integration, more domestic consumption, so that uh, that pattern uh, is changing. China is now the largest export market for all of Asian countries, especially ASEAN. This is a, a trend we hadn't seen 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years, 25 years ago, it was the U.S., EU, and then China was not, you know, not insignificant, but very marginal. Now China is uh, the largest uh, export market. So that's a uh, a new pattern in, in, in Asia. Mainland integration, I see it as more visible, conspicuous than, than maritime uh, integration through connectivity, infrastructure. So you think a lot more uh, mainland Southeast Asia integration through geography, history, um, economy, labor market is integrated, for example, demography, people can move cross border. Um, but overall, we have a divided ASEAN uh, between the US and China. Uh, in the maritime, and then in the mainland, Southeast Asia, along the Mekong region, is more uh, China and Japan. Look, uh, in a short time, I mean, Southeast Asia is doing something that goes against the grain of theory and models and experience. You have authoritarian resurgence, but vibrant economic growth. So you have a, kind of a decoupling. You know, you have dictatorships. Cambodia is a dictatorship, but uh, is expanding 6 to 8 percent a year. Myanmar, civil military compromise, but um, you know, authoritarian flavors. Thailand, military government, this year will be about 4.8, 4.7 percent growth. So you have growth all around the region. This is the fastest growing region in the world, but the governing regimes mixed and authoritarianism is on the rise. Um, 
So we're seeing some de decoupling between politics, authoritarianism, and economic growth. The economic development of the region, um, after 20 years, I mentioned that China is now the largest export market, but there's now more intra-ASEAN investment than ever. Intra-ASEAN trade remains about 24%, but intra-ASEAN investment was never significant, but now it is. And I think we're seeing more ASEAN integration, but in a broader Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia uh, economic integration. Um, the global trade slowdown, basically now the Doha round is kind of dead. So we will see more of the ASEAN space, market of 2.6 trillion GDP, 635 million people. Uh, you see also the GMS, the Greater Mekong Subregion, the CLMTV, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, in mainland Southeast Asia, and CLMT, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, with an integrated finance, healthcare, labor market. Um, and here's a, a map uh, of the region, as you know. Um, here's some figures about uh, how the GMS space, the Greater Mekong Subregion, is going to be about 350 million people, to 1.2 trillion GDP. Um, CLMTV, uh, 250 million, uh, 700 billion GDP. Uh, CLMT, 150 million and about half a trillion GDP. Uh, CLMV, uh, used to be the Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam. That also is coming up. So ASEAN is the fastest growing region in the world. The growth average for the next five years, talk about 5.1, 5.2%. Uh, here's a map of connectivity in mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, and here's another map. Uh, overall, overall, I'm very squeezed for time. Um, overall, I think you have here in Asia, it's a nexus, uh, a nexus of prosperity and insecurity. You have you know, more integrated Asian economies than ever. And uh, the Belt and Road, I think, will pave a lot of ground. I think the Trump trade war will, will indirectly and directly uh, force Asian countries to uh, promote more intra-trade, intra-regional trade, intra-regional investment. Uh, so the broader ASEAN region um, beckons, in my view. Uh, you know, outbound tourism related to the hospitality industry. Uh, almost 90% of outbound tourists from ASEAN go to Asian countries. So there's more intra-Asian travel. There's rising income of Asian populations in different countries. The demographics are favorable, fairly young. You know, in Cambodia, two-thirds of the country uh, is younger than 21. So uh, a lot of room for growth, more regional integration, domestic consumption coming from a lower base, uh, infrastructure connectivity, uh, infrastructure development in the coming years will be immense. Uh, we're talking about, I mean, the Belt and Road, the number they're talking about is $900 billion in the next five to 10 years. And uh, this will be committed uh, and, and financed through the various vehicles that China has put up, um, AIB, Silk Road Fund, uh, and uh, Exim Bank, and so on. Um, so for what we can see, all the indicators, the dynamics are favorable population, rising income, larger middle classes, more affordability, more consumerism, more intra-regional travel, tourism. Um, what is a big concern to me is the politics, is the geopolitics. I think that uh, you know, China has major problems with the Philippines, uh, China and Vietnam, China upstream dams is causing a lot of problems for downstream communities in Cambodia and Vietnam, in Laos. Uh, if Asian countries and Southeast Asia uh, included cannot get along, this, this is really the, uh, the killer. I mean, this is the, the spoiler. Uh, but if you look at the prosperity indicators, all looking pretty good. Uh, there are some other minor concerns, less uh, you know, paramount, like uh, income inequality within societies across the region. This can give rise to populism and corruption and so on. But overall, I would say that uh, the geography of Southeast Asia is its gift. It's the, the development that it has had in the last three, four decades 
has reached a critical mass. People now have, you can see in Jakarta, you will see in Jakarta, well, you can see in Jakarta, you can see in, um, you know, KL, Bangkok, you know, Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, Manila, and so on. More middle classes, more middle classes. Um, you can see fancy cars. You can see uh, people have more spending power. And I'll wrap up in one minute. Um, so I think I, I've, I've made, I'm trying to make the point, and I think uh, as well as I can in the short time, that prosperity, we can count on. Security, we have a problem. And what China does in its pursuit of what I see as its kind of manifest destiny has to be accommodated. We're seeing some pushback. The U.S. can be a, the U.S. resilience, the Trump administration, the trade war, the U.S. can can undermine, can spoil this prosperity. At the same time, these countries in Southeast Asia do not want to be dominated by China. They don't want to go into the debt traps of the Chinese financing vehicles. So there's a balance there uh, that I think uh, will form a kind of new development paradigm for Southeast Asia, for ASEAN. If ASEAN can maintain its central role, to keep the major powers from interfering, at the same time, keep the major powers from conflict, open conflict, then ASEAN countries can stay on the prosperity track uh, because we know now that world, the world is not linear, it is not even curvy, it is more circular. So ASEAN is a good place to be because there's nowhere else to go. Uh, going forward, and then if we can do more ASEAN intra-investment, intra-trade, uh, also enmeshing more with China, uh, keeping the U.S. and China in a mix with Japan and Australia and India in a moving balance, then that's where we need to go. Thank you.